loud voice, lifted up his spirit. And it was at this time that in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 51, the scripture reads that the curtain of the temple was torn in two. The veil of the temple was torn in two. I want to meditate with you this morning for a few moments on this curious event that happened at the cross and how it relates to the access that we gain to God through Christ's flesh. The curtain of the temple or the veil begins its, its place in Jewish religion in Exodus chapter 26. If you have the heavenly library with you, I encourage you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 26. It is here that God is giving his instructions to his people for the tabernacle, the tabernacle that will be his dwelling place for his people that will be suitable for worship to him. And it is within Exodus chapter 26 that we find the ornate instructions, the descriptions given for how the tabernacle is to be built. And the instructions that we find here in the text point towards the physical significance and glory of the God who resides within this tabernacle that is to be built. In verses 31 through 33 of this chapter, we have recorded for us the physical description of the veil or the curtain and its inclusion within the tabernacle as well as its location. In verse 31, And you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and and fine twined linen. And it shall be made with cherubim skillfully worked into it. And you shall hang it on four pillars of acacia overlaid with gold and hooks of gold on four bases of silver. And so basically what we see here is that the, the curtain or the veil is described as the best of the best. It's beautiful. It's elegant, physically described. Verse 33, and you shall hang the veil from the clasps and bring the ark of the testimony in there within the veil. And the veil shall separate for you the holy place from the most holy. And so right from the beginning, we see that once the veil is placed within the tabernacle, what does it do? Well, on the other side of the veil lies the ark, the ark where God's presence dwells with his people. But once that ark has been placed and once that veil or that curtain has been created and placed, it now creates a divide, a physical barrier from God to his people. And so while the physical properties of the veil are certainly significant, they only point towards the greater spiritual aspects of the curtain that we're going to dwell on together this morning. And so under the old law, the first thing that we learn is that the purpose of the veil was to separate God from man. The veil was designed to separate God from his people. I'll admit that when I was younger, and some of us may find this to be the case for them as well, I really struggled to understand why it is that God would want to separate himself from his people. And it's not so much as God wants to, as God needs to. He chooses to for his protection. Why? Why does a God have to keep himself at arm's distance from his people? Well, for one, it wasn't always meant to be this way. This wasn't how God designed his fellowship, his dwelling with his people when he originally created us. And so let's turn our attention to creation account and let's look in Genesis chapter 3. After God creates the earth and the heavens and the skies and all of the animals and people, he, Adam and Eve are created and we're told that fellowship was between God and man. And in Genesis chapter 3, most of us know the story of how Adam and Eve sin and they disobey God. But in verse 8, we learn that after they sin and disobey God, Adam and Eve in their shame hide from the presence of the Lord. 
God, who at that time was walking in the cool of the day in the garden, dwelling with his people in a very physical, grounded way, discovers that his people have sinned and disobeyed him. And so right from the beginning, we have this rift, this divide that God did not create, but Adam and Eve created. And their shame, when they hid from the presence of the Lord because of their sin, they created that separation themselves. God himself knows no sin. God is good and righteous and holy. It is us who sin and create the divide that exists between us. And I think we can all experience this and relate to this in some way. Avoiding, distancing ourselves from others for our own good when they have hurt us. In my life, my mother and I have a very rocky relationship. She's made a lot of poor decisions that have influenced our family for the worse. And because of this, my relationship to her is rather complicated. Even though I love my mother and I would do anything for her well-being, for my own sake and for my well-being, I have to love her from a distance for it is better this way. Because of the glory of God, because he is the very universal definition of that which is good and wonderful and righteous and holy, he cannot be near sin. And therefore, the veil is used for his protection, not only ours. And there are many stories in the Bible throughout history that demonstrate this very fact, such as the story of Nadab and Abihu, and Uzzah who touched the ark and faced the consequences for not following the instructions that were set forward for God's protection. While these stories on the surface are seemingly unsettling to us, they exhibit God's perfection and holiness that he himself safeguards from us. But as you know, the relationship between God and man does not stop there. In God's gracious, compassionate nature, he still sought to establish a physical and spiritual relationship by dwelling with his people in the tabernacle. And so once a year, there is a designated time in, under Jewish law where man would enter into the presence of God. This was in a very limited way, but in some way there was access to God for one man once a year for a few moments. We learn about this in Leviticus chapter 16. In Leviticus chapter 16, God, through Moses, is speaking to the, he's laying the groundwork for a pattern for the high priest to follow. But specifically here, we're talking about Aaron, who was the high priest at this time. And on the Day of Atonement, one day a year, the high priest, here Aaron, would enter in to the holy place. And it is there that he consecrates himself, he cleanses himself. There is a process of bathing and cleansing that he is to undergo in order to prepare him for the presence of the Lord. And once he has undergone this process, he now is ready to offer up the sacrifices on behalf of the nation of Israel. And this process, which included intensive bathing and washing to cleanse the high priest, demonstrated that he was now clean enough in some way to present the sacrifices and enter into the presence of the Lord. And although this process is very strenuous and tedious, it still demonstrated not only access to God's presence in some small way, but it also speaks volumes of God's goodwill and determination to draw near to his people in a very physical, grounded way. And of course, this was not for his benefit, this was for their benefit, for the Jewish people's well-being. Passing through the veil, although only done once a year, was a great honor and a great responsibility to experience fellowship with God in a way that no other people could and no other man specifically could except once a year. 
this fellowship that existed on the Day of Atonement between the high priest and God is difficult to analogize. It's hard to illustrate this, I think. Anything that we could say would fall short in some manner. But in Christ, at the crucifixion of our Lord, the veil that symbolized limited, restricted access to God and separation from him due to sin was torn. That veil that symbolized these things was torn. A change occurred when God chose now not to protect himself from his people, but instead he allowed the word that became flesh and dwelt among men to be tortured and killed. In Christ, the dividing wall that separated man from God had been torn down. Exclusion through the veil now represents fellowship to God through Christ. Back in Ephesians, as we talked about in chapter 2, Paul hammered down on this idea of those who are far off, us being the Gentiles, those who were without God, being brought near through Christ's flesh as a sacrifice. And although the high priest was very close to the presence of God on the Day of Atonement, I can assure you that what he experienced is nothing like the glory that you and I share in the fellowship that we have now through Christ as our high priest. And unlike you and I today, the high priest was, cl- was washed clean for a few moments to present the sacrifices to God. You and I, through the sacrifice that is Christ, have been washed clean once and for all and have ultimate fellowship with God. We have talked already a lot this week about the vertical relationship, the fellowship with God that exists between us and him. And at the risk of hammering this this nail in too far, I want to suggest that the tearing of the temple veil here in Matthew chapter 27 symbolized the door opening for skyrocketing fellowship with God. Ever increasing fellowship with God that knows no limited access or restrictions but full intimate relationship. And not only do we have fellowship with God through Christ at the tearing of the veil, but that fellowship comes with true access to God. In the book of Hebrews, in chapter 10, the Hebrews writer attempts to provide this grounded explanation for what happens between man and God through the blood of Christ. And he records something for us that is so profound that I want us to read together in verse 20 of Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 20, By the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. The new and living way that he opened for us that is his flesh. In Christ, he is the veil, the new veil that we pass through to gain access to God. The mechanism of that sacrifice is his flesh. When Jesus offered up himself, we follow through in fellowship with him and gain our access to God through his flesh. Because of what Jesus did in offering himself up as a sacrifice, because he was willing to shed his blood to give up his flesh for us, nothing now hinders us from an intimate relationship with God. One that is far greater and more glorious than that of which the high priest would experience at the Day of Atonement. Jesus himself is the ultimate offering of atonement on our behalf. And the access that we have to God, we're told here in the text, is a new and living way. 
And that's what, just what Jesus says in the Gospel of John in chapter 14. Most of us know this verse. Shane says it for us all of the time. John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. And Jesus' fleshly sacrifice that is grounded here in Hebrews chapter 10 demonstrates that he himself is the new and living way for us to have full fellowship and full access to God. And of course, this access that we have to God manifests itself in numerous ways. We experience the riches of his grace, the forgiveness of our sins and our trespasses against us. And maybe even more profound is the adoption as sons to being heirs of the promise through Christ Jesus. I love the parable of the prodigal son that we've studied together over the last few months when when Shane presented those sermons. And I think that while they stand alone, I think that if we were going to add a character into that story, it would be the third brother who was never a brother at all. And he stood off from afar and watched the blessings and the experience of the other two brothers. But as we know, the loving father who is kind and compassionate and merciful and loving He accepts this third brother and adopts him into the family who now also gets a place at the table and rejoices with his fellow brothers. And we would be that third brother, I think, in this sense, that we have been adopted through Christ's flesh offered on the cross for our sins. The new and living way that is Jesus And as we dwell on those wonderful promises and the access and the fellowship that we now have with God through Christ, we must recognize that this would not have been possible without his death, without his willingness to give himself up for us. As we prepare to gather around this table and partake of these emblems, I want us to revisit Matthew chapter 27 and look at something that we missed the first time around. In Matthew chapter 27, as we spoke about, Jesus is on the cross and he cries out in the darkness of the land and he yields up his spirit. In verse 51, and behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. Did you catch it? What was the nature of the veil being torn? How was the curtain torn from top to bottom? Without reading too much into this, I think that this symbolizes the nature of our fellowship and our access to God. God did for us what we could not do for ourselves in sending himself as a perfect sacrifice to die on our behalf. And I think we can see this in the nature of how the veil is torn. It is as if God himself above tore down the wall of hostility that separated between himself from us. God himself tore the veil when he gave his son on our behalf. And it is through the tearing of that veil that the door has been opened to us that we now pass through the veil that is Christ's flesh and gain full access and fellowship to God. As we partake this morning, let us keep these things in mind. Please bow with me. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come to you so grateful for that beautiful sacrifice, for giving your Son on that cross for us. We're so grateful 
for this bread, which represents his body that was shed for us. And we pray that as we partake of it this morning, we may clear our minds and focus on the things that we just heard. This we pray through your son, Jesus' name. Amen. Please bow with me as we pray for the cup. We thank you, God, for letting us be able to be here together today to remember the great sacrifice that you and your son endured and for the blood that he came and willingly shed for us so that we may now be able to be in your presence. We ask that you bless us as we do this to praise you. And in Jesus' name, amen. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>